All right, we're starting. We're talking about um, world building with production design. So when you create either sci-fi or a fantasy film or a TV show, you're going to need to do a lot of what is called world building. World building will also be done for every film or show you create, but it's not to as great of an extent as it is for fantasy and sci-fi because you're creating a whole new world, which could include things like religion and um, like different religions, different cultures, different races and things like that. For sci-fi, for fantasy and a lot of sci-fi, you could be creating new species, governments, societies, political systems, financial systems and currencies, materials, tools, planets, solar systems, entire galaxies, if the fashion that the people wear, the cultures, the morals that people have, and what's considered like something good and what's considered something normal, what is considered weird or abnormal in that culture. Laws of physics, you could be creating different ones depending on if you're at a new planet and the gravity works differently and the materials work differently and stuff floats up instead of falling down or whatever you want to do. Those are the types of things that you're, that you're able to do. Uh, you could be creating new weapons, magic. A lot of fantasy has magic. And so you have to create the, how does that magic work? What are the limitations of it? Does it have limitations? Who can use it? How do they learn it? A ton of different stuff just with that one aspect alone. Like I said, religions, you know, they might have different religions. They might celebrate different gods. They might worship a being in the ground. They might worship something that they thought was a god, but it was just a spaceship that landed near them when early on in their civilization, if it's a sci-fi. And so you might be creating- That actually those. happened in real life. What? Apparently. I heard that there was this um, indigenous population that they didn't know about technology very much. And this plane fell there and they didn't know what it was. They thought it was from the gods or something. Uh, I think it was like during World War II or something, right? They were setting up like uh, little base camps. Yeah, I don't know much about it. I just heard about it once and like a teacher commented on it as a tidbit or something. I thought that was interesting. Yeah, and so like w when you're doing a sci-fi or fantasy, that kind of thing would maybe influence your your species or your race or your culture or whatever you're doing, the society would be influenced by their past. And so stuff like that, you could create new gods or just beings of power that maybe people worship, maybe they don't. You could be creating a new afterlife or what the afterlife would be and more. There's so many different things that you could create and do. And that's why it's world building because you have to kind of create it from the ground up and all these different aspects that go into your story have to be figured out. So this stuff comes from the tail foundry. It's letter C in the syllabus. World building, how to start world building series. There's a difference between world building and setting when we talk about places. The place or places we create are our world building, while the setting design focuses on settings only. Settings are the period, the location, level of conflict, and the duration of time that that level of conflict happens in. A location and period make a place or the world we built. All four together with the location, the period, the level of conflict, and the duration make the setting that we designed in that world we built. So stories take place within settings. So when you're world building, you might just be building out the location. You might just be building out what time period it is and where it's happening, the location of it, making the place. And then as you go on making the story, you have to think of a setting and figure out where that setting takes place within that world. Well, what are we focusing on? If we look at this picture and we see this whole planet, Normally, a, a story can't take place across every single room within all these buildings. You know, we have to go into one of these buildings with some of those characters. There may be hundreds of thousands of people on this place, but we're not really focusing on everyone. That was the world we built, but we're just, now we're making the setting and we're focusing on 
an individual story within that world. He gives the example of a medieval villa being the place, a medieval villa that's trying to create a vaccine before the Black Plague then creates the setting. It's a, per, it's a people that are trying to create a vaccine before something happens. So you have the duration when before the Black Plague hits them. They're trying to create a vaccine. That's what they're trying to do. The level of conflict, they're trying to create a, a cure before a disease kills them all. And so now instead of it just being a place, we have the setting of how our story takes place. And that's when we can start thinking of the characters that are in that setting and how they're going to handle this situation. <clears throat> there are three stages of world building. Free design, that's where you carve out the world independent of the setting, creating the locations and the periods of your world. So that would just be, if you were creating a planet, it would just be you creating the look and the overall feel of the planet, the society of that planet, but you're not really creating a, a setting yet. So free design is basically just the, the first step or the earliest step of creating your world. You're just figuring out how many people are here and what does it look like? Is it a city? Is it a desert? You know, what is this place? Fixed, desi fixed design is where you build a world around a setting that you place or decide on within your world. So the level of conflict and the duration within your design locations and period. Free design is basically just, I'm gonna make something out of nothing. Fixed design is thinking of, like I said, now we're inside of one of these buildings and we know that this guy is trying to get promoted so he can move to the, the main building in the middle. And then we have to start thinking of why does he want that? Um, you know, what, how does all this stuff work? And within our world, within the city we built, the free design we just did, now we're doing the fixed design, figuring out all the stuff that's going into our story and the reason we're going to be telling a story in this place. And then there's found design. And that's where, as you are writing out your story in the setting within the world you built, you see that you need to flesh out certain parts of your world more. So maybe as he's doing that, we make some more characters, we think of some more stuff, but then we have to think of, well, how does that work? Or, you know, um, where did they go to sleep? Or where did they go to do this? Any little element that you didn't really think of at first before you started writing out your story is called found design, where you're figuring out on, as you write it out. But whenever you're creating a new place, a new, new thing, a lot of this stuff you need to like think about, make sure you're not overlooking anything so that it all makes sense within the world you're making. So there's no questions like, well, what is their religion? You know, if they say something about religion, well, you have to kind of figure it out now. What religion is there? Are there any other religions? Does it matter within your story? If it does, you need to figure it out and hash out how it works and why they believe that. And then come up with the backstory, even if it's not in the story itself, the backstory will help you as a writer uh, figure out why they believe what they believe. So let's say during free design, we come up with a galaxy for our place. We are gonna make a spacefaring civilization. So, our period is most likely going to be the future, although we could say it's in the past or the present as well. But we'll go ahead and go with the future for this example. So it's the future and humans from Earth have expanded into colonizing different planets. They are colonizing now a new galaxy. So they've gotten to the point where they have to go to a new galaxy to colonize that one because they've spread so far on our own. So we are free building the planets, the solar systems, and how that galaxy is set up. We are figuring out how many planets are to each solar system and how many solar systems there are, you know, and what the center of that thing looks like. Is it a yellow star? 
Does the sun look the same? Does their sun look the same? Um, and all of that type of stuff. We're figuring out everything of how it's built. That's our free building. In our story, we know that they're going to run into another space-faring species who leaves to warn their species about invaders. So now the humans must decide whether they keep going forward and keep trying to colonize this new galaxy with this other species that's already there, or if they're gonna go ahead and leave because they don't wanna have any conflict with them. So now we have our setting and where our story will take place. The fixed design, we figured out within our galaxy that we just built that they're gonna run into another species and they're, the other species is going to leave to tell their, their own uh, that there's some invading species here, the humans. So then the questions start coming up that will need to be answered. So we are world building for this new setting now. How advanced are the other species? Do the humans have weapons and what kind? Are they just on like little um, spaceships that are going to scout everything? So they didn't really think about bringing a bunch of heavy weaponry or do they have, is it kind of like a militaristic effort where they're bringing a bunch of weaponized spaceships along with the colonization effort? Is the ship faster or slower or is it the same speed as the other species? Are the other species more advanced or less as the humans? As we write out the story, we decide we want to find the other species home world. So we start writing out our story, we figure out all, so you figure out all those questions and fix design. Once you figure out your setting, and if you figured out that you want it to be a, you know, another species that they see and all of that, and you figure out you do want them to go ahead and continue on trying to colonize this new galaxy. Now we have conflict because that other species probably doesn't want them to be there. And um, you have to figure out like what's going to happen, but all of those questions start coming up of like how advanced are they? How are they gonna fight if they do fight? And you have to figure out, you should figure out all that stuff before you start actually writing the story. Then when you actually start writing the story, once you have the main beats kind of hashed out, that's when you start getting that found design. And you start thinking like of different things. Maybe you never thought that they would land on that other species home planet. But then as you're writing it, it just kind of comes up and you feel like that would be a really good story plot to do. So then you have found design because now you originally didn't intend to visit their home world. So you haven't really fleshed it out yet. You haven't world built their home planet. So now it's like, what does their home planet look like? How is the atmosphere? Can the humans even breathe it? How does the other species society work? Do they live close together? Do they live far apart? Do they have like huge metropolis cities or do they have like very spread out towns? And what materials and resources exist on that planet and more? You typically, when you're world building, when you're creating a story like this, especially, you want to try to limit the scope of how much world building you actually do. Not to say that you skip over things that are needed within the story, but there's certain things that probably will never appear in the story that you don't really need to flesh out as much as you would for the stuff that's going to uh, be a question in everyone's minds as they're watching your show or your movie. For the example I just gave, the galaxy, we, the galaxy we are making, this new galaxy that humans have never been to, we could spend years as the writer thinking about all the different planets, how they look, what resources they have, if anyone even lives there, what the geography is, and more and more figuring out all the largest and smallest details of that story world. Well, that's not really the story world, of that free design world. And if we delve further and further into our world, ironing out the details, we may never end up actually writing the story because we're spending too much time figuring out every little detail of every single thing when a lot of that stuff's not even going to be a question on anyone's mind. This is known as world builders syndrome. 
getting lost in free design when you're building the world out. And that's how a lot of people, they start creating an idea in their head and then they just keep making all of the ideas and trying to flesh every single thing out before they start writing the story that by the time they are done, they may never get done. But if they do ever get done, it's like so long that they kind of forgot what the original idea of the story was and they don't even know where they want to start because now they have so much, so many planets to pick from that they're like, well, well I got to somehow cram all of this in. I spent so long thinking of it. You know, the grass on this planet's purple and that's because when it rains there, blah, 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 blah. And you know, all these details that don't really matter because that never really was going to appear in their story in the first place. But because they spent so long figuring all of that out, if they do ever get to the writing it, they try to cram it all in. And that can be a very convoluted, broken up story because it's not really isolated. It's not, it's not a setting. It's just trying to tell a story over the entirety of your planet or your galaxy or whatever you created. And uh, that can be a really big problem for a lot of writers. So instead of doing broad strokes of design for free design and then limiting the scope to design for our setting with fixed design, they decided to go ahead and just, you know, create all of their entire world, no matter how big it is. If you think about all the things that go into world design, like if you think about our actual world and how much history we have and how many different places and things and how everything works, you could spend a very, very long time going over every single detail to make it, to make something like that. Especially in our example with the galaxy, now you have you know, a multitude of, of different things you can think of if you really wanted to. You can think of 100,000 different species and races that all live on different planets. But if you ever think of what your story should be or how you're gonna limit the scope of that world so you can tell a confined story within it, then, it's never, then it usually doesn't really work out well. Because the story isn't gonna take place in every planet. So we don't need to figure out what kind of minerals exist on each and every one. If our story involves the planet or mentions the minerals from the planet or something like that, that's when you do the found design as you're writing it and figure out what kind of minerals that planet has because now it's in the story. That way you don't get too bogged down in world design and world building on the grand scale and just flesh out the world fully within your story. And then there's some people that build out the world, then choose the conflict and duration or the setting. And then there's some other people who think of the conflict and duration and then build a place around that. There's different ways to do it. If you wanna start with the story and then build around it, you can. It's just generally when you're world building, people will start the other way around. They'll make a planet or they'll make a world or a city and then they'll figure out, they'll limit the scope and then they'll figure out their setting, what happens, and then answer any questions that might come up during that. And then they start writing out their story. And if any questions come up within the story, then they do the found design and flesh out the rest. But you can start at the other end. You can start writing out the story and then creating the world as you go. If there's any questions that come up, you know, maybe in the story they visit a new planet. Well, now you gotta figure out everything about that planet is it in the same solar system or is it in a different one? All of that different stuff. So there's different ways to do it. Uh, the main thing about world building is just making sure that there's no unanswered questions within your story about the world or how it works. And as a writer or creator of that place, you want to yourself know how that place works or at least have a general idea as you write it out so that you can think of how the characters would interact with each other, how they would react. Are they cold and distant or are they very friendly and welcoming? Well, what happened in their past to kind of make them that way? It'll make you kind of be in that world as you're writing it more than if you're just looking at it from the outside in. And as a viewer, after you're done writing it, they shouldn't have any questions that they're like, well, how are they doing this? Or, well, what does this even look like? Or what are they talking about? 
because they've never shown this and they don't show it at all in the movie. So we have no idea what they mean because it wasn't fleshed out. They didn't answer that question of what that stuff is. But anytime, it's not just with fantasy and sci-fi. Anytime you create a story, no matter how, no matter the genre or how big the thing is, you're going to be doing a little bit of world building. Because you'll be creating, like even if you take a sitcom, you'll, you might be where are they at? And, and you might be putting them in a place that's real, but you're creating a neighborhood that doesn't actually exist. And then how does that neighborhood work? Is it different from everything else? You won't do as much because you don't have to figure out what those people believe and all of that because that's already kind of ingrained in our society. But you will have to think of a few details here and there as you write out the story. And that's still stuff you wanna think about and make sure that you don't leave out so people question you know, where this place is or what's going on. You never want people wondering, um, why something wasn't there, why something wasn't answered, because that'll just bug the audience. Does anyone have any questions, comments, or anything to add about world building? I would say even if you think, oh, they'll probably assume this because of this, just make sure that your story is tight because a lot of, that's a lot of pet peeve for a lot of people. It's like, if I have to rationalize it, to make it make sense even if oh and if you think about it this way it makes sense if i have to do that too much then you're not doing a good enough job at, ex at telling your story or explaining it well enough it's it's a diff there's a difference between leaving it to where oh we can come to that conclusion or where the story's building up to that and you trust the the viewer to be smart enough so you don't have to hand feed everything to them and make them feel like they're stupid where you over explain but there's also the other extreme where you will have a storyline or a world that you build and you're like oh they can probably assume that this is the magic works because of this or oh they can probably make excuses to why this would they can pro probably come up with a, an explanation as to why this works or why this system is this way those kinds of things it's good that you have like something that makes sense that isn't too spoon fed but also is clear enough to where you wouldn't the viewer wouldn't have to jump to too many through too many hoops to justify it or to explain the reason for that thing in your world or for that rule Am I making sense? I don't know if I'm explaining this properly. Yeah, I think it makes sense. Okay. Because that's just something that I've noticed a few people commenting on with recent storylines and, and, and worlds lately. It's a tricky thing um, because really there is. is there is like too much exposition -y, like answering things that don't need to be answered because we can assume stuff. Sometimes when we're watching films, if somebody leaves their house and the next scene is them entering a church, we automatically assume, okay, they left their house and they either got in a car or they walked to the church and went in, uh, you know? And so like some, some will, will over explain things. Yeah. Oh yeah. I was just out walking and it's like, okay, we understand that. We don't need that throwaway line, but others will leave out big questions about how things work or why, and just assume that the audience. Magic will, is a huge, yeah. yeah. Like magic is a huge thing of that. Um, they will over explain other parts of the world or their um, or why they're evil, their justification for things. They're, they'll over explain the characters and have them over explain their, their motivations and whatever. But the rules of the magic or of the politics or whatever, they'll just be like, yeah, I'm sure they'll, I'm sure it makes sense. And they can, they, they can see it could work they can rationalize it but they don't explain the world as well but they over explain the character's motivation that's one example that i can think off the top of my head but yeah it is it is complicated because a lot of movies lately have done one or the other they've either either over explained and over and treated us like we're stupid or they just like oh we assume you'll know this or Oh yeah, well, it'll it makes sense if you think about it. 
and they don't build the build do the building blocks to lead us to that conclusion they just assume that we'll know yeah or that we'll rationalize it yeah and so if whenever you have a word about- like this um the screenwriter you know like or the person writing it if you're writing a book you obviously need to do a lot more world building and explaining than you would if you're writing a screenplay and that's because with a screenplay you are going it's going to go through phases it's going to have a production designer and the production designer is also going to be involved a lot in the world building okay you said that this uh this there's this church and they worship you know some kind of form of being or god or underground thing well what does their church look like because of that and they'll be like thinking of all these different things of how that would make sense within the world that's built so the production designer will be building on to all of these things in the script and a lot of the stuff in the script might not have that backstory and that is where the production designer comes in to fill in the gaps and fill in the stuff that's missing so that it's in the background and it's prominent enough to be seen and understood without standing out to take over the story. Yeah, world building is definitely a tricky thing, but the more you can use subtleties and subtext in in the creation of those new worlds or those new concepts, I feel like that, that those are great tools that you can use instead of constantly relying solely on dialogue or solely on very in-your-face imagery, a, a balance of them, I think, is, is very important and very helpful. All right, moving on from that, we're talking about M and E tracks. This stuff comes from Filmmaking Stuff, the channel Filmmaking Stuff. It's on YouTube. It's what is an M and E track, letter A, and the syllabus. Yeah. An m and track is a music and effects track. If you are trying to get a distributor with any kind of international distribution, an m and track is one of the deliverables that you'll need to give to the distributor in most deals. So most of the time, they are going to need an m and track so that they can, um, well, I'll just read my notes. What is it? What it is is the final mix of the audio but you take out the dialogue tracks, which hopefully you have separated your audio into different tracks and stems, but it's basically everything but the dialogue so that if the film distributes internationally, it can be dubbed in another language. So that way, you know, it doesn't have English and over the top of the English, there's German uh, dubbed dubbing. And if you look at the picture, it actually shows that pretty well. So there's like a dialogue track, another dialogue track. There could be like two, three, five, however many characters you have. They'll usually have their own dialogue track. And those all go into a dialogue bus or a dialogue stem, which is just a grouping of those different tracks together so that they, when you move one, you can move all of them. And whenever you do the master mix, you're gonna have all three of these things. You're gonna have the dialogue, the music, and the sound effects. But when you're doing a music and effects track, you just leave out the dialogue and you do the music and the effects the same exact way you would if you did the final mix. You're just leaving out all the dialogue so that it is um, able to be dubbed. Some countries don't do subtitling or don't like seeing subtitled movies and would rather have their own dubbing. So some movies, some countries wouldn't even accept a movie unless it had an m and track attached, which is why distributors don't want it because they want to try to distribute to all of the countries if they can, however many countries they can get. And if there's anything that's going to turn them away, then it, they don't want that because they want as much money as they can get. Other countries, Um, Other than that, may offer both subtitled and dubbed versions of the film in theaters and streaming services. So it may allow you to go to the theater and this one's screening the subtitled version, which is uh, still in English. And this other one's dubbed in their language of whatever country you're at without the subtitles. So they need the original language audio, the original dialogue gone, 
so that they don't have overlapping words in different languages when adding their own dubbing. This stuff comes from Mr. Audio Sound Images, letter B in the syllabus, fully filled m and &E track. So something called a fully filled m and &E track. And um, when making audio for a film, it's often separated into three stems, the dialogue, the music, and the effects, or it's called DME, DME, dialogue, music, effects, and stems. And you can see that in this picture, there's the three separated ones, all of the music, if there's separate music bits, they'll be on separate tracks, but they're all gonna be part of that same music grouping. And same thing with the effects, same thing with the dialogue. Stems are just a grouping of different audio tracks together. Uh, blah, 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 blah. I mean, it's the same thing as putting similar files into a folder on your computer. They're still separate files, but you can grab the folder and move it and all those files are gonna move at once. That's why it's done just for ease and organization. However, sometimes some sound effects like footsteps, doors, or sounds that are hard to recreate, like recreate digitally, sometimes those are actually filmed on set. And they'll, <clears throat> because of that, they will actually be in the dialogue tracks. Because when you're on set, you're filming, you're recording audio for the dialogue. But if they're talking while they're doing some things like walking and shutting the doors, some films, they try to record those sounds on set as well uh, because it's easier, especially different things that you can't really find uh, that are kind of more difficult to, to make a digital version of or make it without the actual item or tool. Like a, maybe like a coffee machine, a certain one, it makes a weird noise when you turn it or you twist the knob or you turn it on or whatever. So, they try to film that sound effect because it's very unique. And so they try to get it on set. And because of that, it might be mixed in with the dialogue tracks. So when making an m &E track, that can obviously be an issue because then the sound effect is going to disappear whenever you remove the dialogue. So what a fully filled m &E track is, is it's where you have added back in sounds and music and post. Oh, there could also be music that's uh, in the dialogue track. If, for instance, the guitar string was actually filmed, the sound of the guitar was actually filmed on set while the actor sang it. Uh, and in that instance, the guitar sound and the dialogue or the singing would be in the dialogue sound effects, this dialogue tracks. So whenever you remove the dialogue to make an m and &E track, the sound of the guitar goes away too. So you have to add back in the guitar without adding in the dialogue. So um, when you make it and you, when you finish filling all that stuff back in, then you have a fully filled m and &E track where it is fully filled with all of the music and all of the sound effects, no matter what track they had appeared in, you recreated them and put them back in so that when you take out the dialogue, it's still going to sound <clears throat> the same. It's still gonna have all the sound effects and all the music that is needed for it to uh, be easy to dub in another country. Sometimes things like grunts, laughs, and breathing or just breaths will be in sound effects stem instead of dialogue. So you want to see, because sometimes those are added uh, after the fact, they're added in post-production. So you want to check with your distributor and see if they need those types of things removed or not. Some will be fine leaving those in. Uh, what they recommend is putting them into a separate track all on their own and making it called optional elements making that like a separate stem or separate grouping. And that way, if the distributor wants to remove laughs, grunts, and other stuff, and they'll just recreate it when they do the dubbing, then they'll ask for those things to be removed. Otherwise, if they're fine with keeping it, then you can just leave it in, so. 
Uh, so that's the that's that stuff. Actually, I have notes on my other thing. But when making an audio mix, sometimes when a voiceover or narration comes, the music is dipped, meaning the level is brought down. So the dialogue is more clearly heard. And you can see this anytime you hear somebody talking over, maybe it's an intro to a show. Scrubs did this a lot, where the uh, main character is narrating. And so whenever you're hearing the music, it's really loud. But when they start talking, the music goes way lower so that you can hear the, the person talking. So with an M&E track, you normally want to check what your distributor requires because they may request what's called an undipped version. And that's because other languages will be slightly different like for the uh, where you need to dip it because they're the words that they're saying, even though they're the same sentences, they're going to be either longer or shorter than English. Because of that, the dips in the music level will no longer line up correctly if you just leave them in for the new dubbing for the voiceover or narration. So you deliver an undipped version instead so that the international dubbers can do their own dips to match it to the new language. So at first, it sounds like it's really easy to do an M&E track, it's just removing the dialogue, but depending on what kind of project you've done, depending on if you have some kind of voice stuff like laughs and, and grunts and whatever else in your sound effects grouping, or if you have music or sound effects in your dialogue grouping, it can uh, be a little bit trickier to recreate and, and cost a little bit of money to actually create those uh, sound effects back in or that music back in and then uh, create a fully filled m and &E track. And then of course, like I said, if there's any narration or voiceover or something or just talking in general that makes the, the music level go down for those spots, they typically will want that removed so that the whoever's doing the dubbing can do their own dipping, can lower the sound of the music whenever they have whoever's doing the dubbing in their language. Uh, whenever their words appear, they can have the music lower for that. Does anyone have any questions, comments, or anything to add about M and E tracks? It's another deliverable. So this is a deliverable often needed when you're getting a distribution deal. What? All right, next thing we're talking about is character arcs, mainly in TV, but also in film. Um, film, it's just a lot shorter of an arc because it has to be from the beginning and then they have their arc somewhere in the middle or the end before the movie ends. Or in TV, it can be a lot longer of an arc, a lot slower of a change. Character arcs are how a character grows, changes, or chooses to stay the same over the course of time. They happen in both films and TV, but TV is where they shine because we get to see what they go through and how each new situation brings them closer or further away from a different way of being or thinking or believing. In TV, it is more drug out. There's longer time between the change. So it's usually more impactful because we follow these characters on this whole journey. Film series can do this too, but standalone films don't have the amount of time needed for us to have as long of a journey with them. So it can be impactful, but arguably it's way more impactful when you see TV show characters either choose to not turn for the better or choose to turn you know, for the worse or just choose to stay the same and not change at all. 
than it is in a film because we've spent more time with these people if we've watched the whole series. Films can have fantastic character arcs and can surprise audiences a lot more because they may not have seen it coming, but when they look back, it, it makes more sense. But on TV, people can usually start to see it coming because there's small hints here and there. Um, and so on, on television, it's a bit easier to see where something might be going than in a film because there's less time to draw the conclusion and you're watching it as you are doing it. On TV, you have time in between episodes to think about it if you're not just uh, streaming the whole thing at once. This stuff comes from Studio Binder. It's letter A in the syllabus, how to create a TV character and develop their arc. To make a character arc, you need to ask who, what, and where. Who is this story about? And what are their character traits and personality? How do they act? What do they want out of life? What do they like? And what are their beliefs? What, what has happened to our character that defines them and makes them who they are? What is happening to them now? And what will happen to them later? that will start to change the way they think about something or make them think the same of the world, have the same beliefs or have the same struggles. Where, where does the character live? What are the cultural and societal influences that can help shape the character? Location is very important to figuring out some side characters and how they might behave to fit in or to stand out. A character in Hawaii typically won't be the same as one in Greenland, just because their outlook on life might be different. Maybe one looks at the world as more brutal or more forgiving or more relaxed or more uh, business-like or vacation-like. You know, it depends on where they're at that can change the way the people in the surrounding area behave, and that can help it inform your character of how to behave whether they choose to act like the rest or choose not to. Once you know your character and your surrounding characters, you then ask, what do they want from each other? Commitment, admiration, do they wanna make somebody proud? Do they just want friendship? Do they want love? Do they just want money, sex, loyalty, approval, and on and on. This leads to knowing your characters, who they are, why they are that way, what has, is, and will happen to them, and where they live and how their surroundings might change how they think. As a show goes on, a character might realize that they don't need the admiration from the one they were seeking it from. Maybe they were cynical and pessimistic, and now they've become more optimistic over the course of time and situations. Maybe they were naive and overly hopeful and now have gained more experience and are a bit more realistic. Watching each individual character and seeing how they deal with the past, present, and future situations while interacting with others, given their individual personality traits, is what keeps us coming back to watch them more and more. We want to see how they deal with the situation. We wanna see if their friend character can help convince them to change or see the world a different way or not. And we wanna see if they actually do change or if they just stay the same, especially depending on their personality from the beginning. This stuff comes from Tyler Mowry. It's letter B in the syllabus, building a TV series, episode three, character arcs. Not all characters are going to have drastic change. Some have little to no change, but still typically face philosophical dilemmas. They just choose to see it all the same way. He breaks down the character arc in season one of Breaking Bad, showing the changes happening throughout. I definitely recommend watching his video if you have the time, because he does a very good analysis of how that character is changing throughout the season and what they're deciding to either change for the better, change for the worse, or start to change for the better or the worse, and then revert back to how they were because of some other situation that happens later. 
Change can also be seeming like it's leading one way and then a situation happens to them where they revert back to a different situation or a different way of thinking again, where they were thinking something in the beginning, they started to see the world a different way, or they started to believe something new, and then something happens to them where they um, basically throw that new idea out the window and go back to the way they originally thought. This can happen a lot when you have uh, characters that enter relationships with people who are giving them a different point of view on the world. And after they date them for a bit, they're starting to change and see the way they're thinking, okay, I get it. Yeah, you, that makes sense, that makes sense. But then if they break up, they kind of, some of them will revert back to the way they were before they dated that person. Some of them will have learned and grown and changed a bit from them and then continue to change as they go on. It just depends on your character and how you want to write them. This next stuff comes from Studio Binder, letter D in the syllabus. And it is how to write a character arc, positive change character arcs explained. So Studio Binder, <clears throat> they break down character arcs into four different endings. Like they say endings like those can mostly be about character arcs because the characters are either going to have a sweet ending, a semi-sweet ending, a bittersweet ending, or a bitter ending. And they show this by saying what the character needs and what the character wants are often two different things. In a sweet ending, what the character needs and what the character wants might be the same thing, or they get both. They get both what they need and they get what they want. And that's the sweet ending. They've gotten everything that they, you know, they needed and wanted in that film or that show. And that's a very sweet ending, happy ending. Um, a semi-sweet ending is they didn't get what they want because what they thought they wanted isn't what they needed. They get what they need and that makes it a semi-sweet ending. It's, it's still sweet. It's just not exactly, they didn't get exactly what they wanted, but they didn't really need what they wanted. They just thought they needed that. Bittersweet endings, they get what they want, but they don't get what they actually need. And so what they wanted again, wasn't what they needed, but this time they do get what they want. They just don't get what they need. And a bitter ending is they don't get either what they want or what they need. And so we'll break that down a bit. There are characters wants and characters needs. For character arcs and story endings specifically, there are four ways to end it. Sweet ending where the character gets what they want and what they need. Semi-sweet, I already said all those, I'm gonna skip it. There are positive change arcs where a character changes for the better. This happens a lot with semi-sweet endings where what the character thought they wanted wasn't what the character needed, but what they needed makes them happy. A character's need is often unknown to them until it comes to them. They often don't know what they need until they get it. Maybe what they thought they needed was love, and a girlfriend or love from a parent figure or something like that. And then they find out what they really needed was their, uh, to recognize that they already have that love from friends or from siblings or something like that. So they realize that they already have the love that they wanted without receiving it from who they wanted to receive it from. And that's where like a semi-sweet ending might come up. All right, this next stuff still comes from Studio Binder, it's letter E. The social network analysis, how David Fincher and Aaron Sorkin craft a perfect fall arc. They describe what they call a fall arc where the character falls further away from truth to believe what they call a lie, which is basically whatever the character says or thinks that they need, but it's most likely that it's just a want. They just choose to see it as, I need this. I need this thing. I need more money. I need to be loved and adored. I need to have a bunch of friends. I need to have this big, huge business. If we're talking about social networking. The Godfather. Yeah, Godfather too. Perfect. I need to have my father's respect and love and those kinds of things. 
So what everyone else says that they need are different, but the character believes what they want will make them happy and fulfill them. So they pursue that want no matter what happens. Fall arcs are often found in bittersweet endings where the character gets what they wanted, but not what they need. Any fall arcs are usually negative change arcs. They change for the worse, the character. So a protagonist that refuses to change, even if it's destroying the relationships, friendships, finances, or health. A fall arc could also be a character falling into addiction to drugs or something like that, where they feel like that's what they need to be happy, even though what they really need is to realize that, you know, they need something completely different, but they feel like they need the drugs to make them happy and they'll do it over and over again, even though it's destroying their lives. So the bittersweet ending is, okay, you got what you wanted. You got a bunch of drugs or you got a bunch of money or you got your power, but you lost everything that was really important to you along the way. In the social network, uh, he loses his friendship with the guy because he wanted so badly to be popular and to be liked and to have this big, huge, successful business to do something important with his life. He wanted to be important, that he destroyed his friendships and um, along the way, the best friend that he ever had destroyed that friendship just to achieve that. So what he needed was really to figure out that he didn't need all that stuff to be popular. He just needed to realize that he had a really great friend who people who cared about him. Uh, but he wanted more, so he got what he wanted, but he didn't get what he needed at the end. And then he ends up being lonely and alone. Again, this comes from Studio Binder, letter F in the syllabus. How to write a screenplay that's a crowd pleaser, back to the future, and a flat character arc. So then there's the flat character arcs where the protagonist doesn't really change but they actually change the world around them. This is where sweet endings is usually has this, where the character gets what they want and what they need and it can often be found in flat arcs. The character is positively changing the people or places around them. Other sweet endings usually involve a positive change arc. So a flat uh, thing, they, they use the example of Back to the Future, saying that, you know, he, uh, Marty McFly, he didn't really change. He was kind of the same character all the way throughout. But what happened was he was positively changing everything around him. He went back to the past. He ran into his dad, his mom. He got them to be, um, fall in love again, or he got them to fall in love when he was getting ready to ruin it anyway. But in doing so, he also gave more confidence to his dad, which helped change their lives for the better when he went back to the present. And doing so, it was a, it was a uh, sweet ending. The character got what they needed and what they wanted, all by just not really changing the way they are, but changing the things around them for the better. Other than that, I would say sweet endings, it's usually somebody who we've been watching that didn't know what they needed, but they knew what they wanted. And they're generally a pretty good person or they're a neutral person, or sometimes they're a negative person. And they just change for the better until they become positive. And they, uh, actually this is seen a lot in Christmas movies where you know they're, they're all about business and money and whatever else. And then they realize that they want to be better and they, they um, they like give money to charity and they spend more time with their family at the end and all of that stuff happens where it's a sweet ending. They get what they needed and they get what they wanted in the end. And then the last thing about this comes from Studio Binder Letter G, the Godfather analysis, the rise and fall of Michael Corleone or a corruption character arc. So this is where the Godfather really comes in. Uh, I, I still really recommend watching these four videos because they give examples and break down the scripts and the uh, as they go through the 
the film and they show, they, they show some of the scenes to show how those arcs happen. They discuss the corruption arc last. It starts with a character who is good, but throws away that chance and consciously, consciously chooses darkness. Corruption arcs can appear in bitter endings where the character doesn't get what they want or what they need. And you can combine arcs and endings from different stories, but you need to know your character's wants and needs. I think they gave the example of the, the Godfather being that he, what did he want in the Godfather? Did he want family? Is that what was that his main want? Everything. We went through the, this oh, whole thing where it was like, it's not about family. The guy said it like 20 million times. <laughs> like his main motivation is something. I don't remember. But it was. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, regardless, they say like. <clears throat> There's a lot of stuff. watch the video, they show the There's examples a lot of, of how he, he neither gets what he really wants or what he really needs in the end. And so it's more of a bitter ending. Uh, we see him fall from somebody who was a very big on family and he didn't want to fall into the mafia he didn't want to do what his negative side of the family did he wanted to just have his own family and his own life but then he starts going into it and deciding to take over and he wants to I think he wants to make his father proud maybe but then you know that doesn't end up happening and and uh, what he needs is to realize that he doesn't, that he shouldn't do that, and that he should stay with. I his think you're mixing both of the brothers' storylines together, but it has been a long time since we watched The Godfather. Yeah, I need to rewatch it. Yeah. Either way, what happens is he neither he doesn't get what he originally wanted. He ends up being the Godfather himself, but he doesn't really. He never really wanted that at first, or at least not spoken out loud. So. Uh, he doesn't end up getting that, but he also doesn't get up what he needs because he really doesn't need that, and he's corrupting himself for the worse. And so it's a bitter ending. This next stuff comes from StudioBinder.com. It's letter H in the syllabus. Studio Binder loves talking about character arcs, and I think they're a really good resource. Uh, an ascending character arc or positive change arc can be either a straight climb starting from neutral or negative and just gradually increasing. So it's just like a straight line starting from the bottom left corner and going up to the top right. Or it can be a U or a V shaped arc where the character starts neutral or positive, hits their lowest point, perseveres and goes back to a positive position, having a positive change in the end. The opposite can happen for a descending or negative change arcs. The character could start from a positive place or a neutral place and gradually descend into being negative. So again, it could be the top left corner and then you just have a straight line going down to the bottom right corner. Or it could be uh, it could start from negative or a neutral place and they could reach their highest point. So they're starting to change for the better. Somebody's in their lives giving them information and uh, giving them a different point of view. So they're starting to decide that maybe life's not the way I thought. And they're up here now in the middle, all the way at the top, get to their highest point, And then something happens, which makes them reject all of that and spiral back down to a negative place and that could happen for various reasons but basically they started either neutral or negative they went positive and then they fall back into negative oh here you go looks like that so that could be the um that character arc where it's a where they start from negative they go up to being positive and they go back down to being negative again so there's not one way to do it, but does anyone have any questions, comments, or anything to add about character arcs? All right, and they were um, take, I actually bought this book because the what Studio Binder was referencing was this book 
creating character arcs, the masterful author's guide to uniting story structure, plot, and character development by K.M. I think it's Wayland. Uh, so if you're interested in reading more about those, like the flat arc, the corruption arc, and those other ones we were talking about, she explains all of it, or he, I think it's a girl, but I don't know, in her book or his book. All right, last thing we're talking about is filler episodes in television. So this uh, example I have pulled up says, anime is usually based on manga, a type of Japanese comic popular with people of all ages. Filler refers to story in an anime that was not in the manga or not in the original comic. These are created because anime production usually outpaces the manga. Fillers do not further the story and usually are of lower quality, both visually and narratively. In other TV shows, it's kind of the same thing. It doesn't, it's not, doesn't mean it necessarily has to be based off of material that they are outpacing, but it's just something to kind of fill the episode count or fill the runtime. It's filler because it doesn't really need to be there. If you skip that episode, you wouldn't really be confused about what is happening in the story. You didn't miss any major beats uh, and you can continue on watching like that. This stuff comes from Cheddar, it's letter to the YouTube channel Cheddar. Why every TV show has a noticeably boring episode. Cheddar explains. Letter A in the syllabus. Um, so before, well, they call them something different. This is a bit different than filler episodes, but it's called bottle episodes. So bottle episodes are episodes typically confined to one location without a lot of special effects, graphics, or other stuff that will cost the studio or network a lot of money. Bottle episodes rely on the dialogue between the characters. In Seinfeld, they have an episode when they're waiting to be seated at a restaurant the whole entire episode. It takes place in a uh, one of the rooms you'd go into to talk to the hostess or host to get them to seat you. So it's one location, the whole episode. In Friends, the one where no one is ready, it takes place in their apartment and that's it. They don't go anywhere else for the whole episode. And it's a reason why they are done. Bottle episodes are there to save money that will be used on another episode of the season. So definitely bottle episodes, some of them can also be considered filler episodes, but bottle episodes just means it's kind of more contained. It doesn't need to be filler. It could still uh, progress the story in some aspect, the overall story, of course, not the episode story, but the overall season or the overall series can move forward in that episode. It's just confined to one space and uh, doesn't try to spend a lot of money and relies more on dialogue than anything else. Filler episodes are episodes that are or can be unrelated to the plot, don't significantly change relations or the dynamics between characters, and are generally there just to take up space. Bottle episodes, you can have relationships between characters altered, but when they don't, and nothing really happens in that episode to further the story, you can typically call that one a filler episode. Another reason filler episodes are created is because a show will have a certain number of episodes ordered per season. And sometimes the main story can only stretch so far. So these semi-pointless episodes are written in place to pad the episode count. So a network might say, we want 22 episodes for this season. And the main story arc that was planned can only stretch for like 20 episodes, realistically speaking. So then those two episodes that are left are just going to be random kind of side stories that aren't going to further that story plot, but are just going to be their kind of their own thing. And then again, if an audience misses a filler episode, it's typically not needed 
and they can miss or skip the episode without getting lost in the greater narrative. Another reason filler episodes are made is because the writers are starting to run out of ideas for this show. Maybe there's too many episodes in that season, or maybe they had more seasons than you know they originally intended, and that can end up making them have a lot of what they what people feel are filler episodes because they don't really have any story. They don't really advance anything. They kind of just are their own contained story within one episode. And so typically speaking in a TV show, you're going to have something happen that's going to sort of further the plot of the whole season. Within that, you're also going to have it furthering the plot of the series as a whole. And then you're also going to have the individual episode plot furthering. But in a filler episode or a bottle episode, sometimes it might only be that episode furthering along. The season won't get furthered along and neither will the series. And you could skip it entirely and still keep up with the main overall story. Does anyone have any questions or comments or anything to add about filler episodes or bottle episodes? Um, yeah, can it be like a party? Like say, you know, you, you shoot like a few parties, you know, they, they, they really don't have any really content to it, you know. Can that be a, a sample of a filler? Sometimes, yeah, like if the party is really, it's kind of just like a side thing that has nothing to do with like the overall show. It's just kind of a, a party they're having in their house because for whatever reason, they're just throwing a party. Then yeah, yeah I would say like that's a filler episode that's just there to, to be there. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was the first. Other episodes that are definitely filler are the ones that if you're watching a sitcom and you see one that has the... Um, flashbacks to earlier episodes like the whole the whole episode is just a flashback to like different moments you guys remember the best moments we've had and they show like the best moments of the series do you remember the sad moments <laughs> they go through that i would definitely say that's a filler episode as well oh, yeah okay. it's just recall and i hate it out. i don't care how much i love the show I love Friends, but I always skip that episode because I'm like, I remember everything. I don't need to watch it again. It's just, I'm glad that they don't do that anymore. They used to do that a lot more with older shows. And you know, they a lot of shows do that. Mainly sitcoms will do that kind of filler episode where it's just like calling back to earlier, earlier movies. Yeah, but some of them are like, we literally just watched this a few episodes ago. Why are we calling back to it? <laughs> like, yeah. But yeah, so that that would be plus. Crucial. I feel like oh, sorry. I was gonna say I feel like that should be for like end of the show, last season type of thing. Maybe now, if you're doing it in like season five of ten, it's just like why are we doing this? Like you know, but to be fair, they don't really know when they're gonna end. But I just feel like those kinds of things are more like. It's hard because in the last season you want every episode to mean something and every episode to like be a part of it. But also I just feel like it, it's more impactful near the end and feels less like filler and more like, oh, we're saying goodbye soon. You know, you can get away with it more, I'd say. Yeah, yeah. especially when you're just like, or when a character has a death some character dies and they recall all the events that happened with that character. But yeah, filler episodes can happen in more than just sitcoms. There can also be especially like story driven series. They can have an episode where I think uh, Avatar The Last Airbender had these where they were kind of just sitting around the camp. And I mean, even though they did it pretty well, filler episodes also don't have to be crappy is the other thing. You can do it pretty well and you can have a good episode. And some of the best episodes people say is like the ones where people are sitting around and they're just, there's no outside action happening. They're just talking and learning more about the characters and, and people really enjoy it. So they don't have to mean that it's crappy. What a filler episode just means is that it's not really advancing the plot as a whole. And so in Avatar The Last Airbender, uh, if you guys have seen that, they have some episodes where they just sit around the camp and they're talking or they're fighting, but it doesn't really 
uh, affect the plot. You can kind of skip those episodes and still know what's going on because they're kind of just traveling from one location to another. I would say if they're done well, filler episodes can also, like if you care about the characters, they can also serve to just make the characters feel more like lived in, feel more like real people and make you care more. Because I've seen filler episodes that like they don't further the story in a sick in a story that in like a TV show or whatever that is supposed like more often than not every episode has a purpose. But I really enjoy those filler episodes because you get to just hang out with the people and just enjoy those characters and feel more connected to them and more like they're real people. So it yeah. can also it can also really serve your story if you do it right. Yeah, another reason why filler episodes are created is intentionally to give the audience if it's like an action packed show, it's to give the audience kind of a breather in between something that just significantly happened. So that can be another reason why they intentionally insert a filler episode or a bottle episode. Bottle episodes, I would say, are more about the finances because maybe there's a big battle at the end of the season and they want to make sure they have enough funding for it. So they make a bottle episode that's very contained and very, uh, doesn't cost nearly as much as the one that's going to have all the special effects and visual effects and CGI and all this other stuff. Um, and so that's what a bottle episode is where a filler episode is more like either to give a breather because they ran out of ideas or um, just because they don't have enough stuff for the amount of episodes that they have to do that the network made them take on. All right. So Monday, we're going to talk about scale and proportion and design. We're going to talk about film festivals, how to submit to them, and also their fees and the costs that are associated with them. And other than that, I'll just remind everybody, we still have our two exercises that are going to be due, I think, next week. Yep, next week during the meeting, we're going to be doing those, the one with color and the one with concept and creation, so like a mood board or a lookbook. If anyone has any questions or comments, uh, just email me and ask. And see you guys Monday. Good night, guys. See you Monday. This was a really good discussion. I enjoyed it. Wow. And we learned a lot. Oh, okay, that's so it came so late, guys. Um, just going over. Sorry, I missed the first little bit of the class. Did I miss anything super important on that?